British rule to continue, but because we're going to be returned to a communist regime. I think that they're bullies. I mean, why should one play the game entirely by their rules? I mean, when you say a British governor is irresponsible, like that's strong language. Hong Kong will never be able to survive without China. China can survive without Hong Kong. What I don't know is whether they will want to have a breakdown in Peking and say, that's it. No point in talking about this anymore. Good afternoon. Day two of Chris Patton's visit to Beijing. Day one had gone badly. The courtesies were properly observed, but behind the smiles, there was ice. Nothing went right. They wanted to um, bully me off my ground, or at least get me to start making concessions. Um, some of them may have wanted a complete breach and to just to walk away, which I think would have been unsettling. Um, they haven't got either. From one minister to another, the show hiding the truth. Hi, how are you? They are absolutely obsessed with Martin Lee. I mean, unbelievably so. And I suspect it's what trickles down from the leadership. Um, but they're obsessed with Martin Lee, with Hong Kong becoming a focus for um, unrest in China, with um, the threat that they may not have control over Hong Kong. And they also think that we've um, pulled a fast one on them by finding ways of extending democracy indirectly. It's the custom in China to provide a banquet for official guests, however unwelcome they might be. The British always respond in kind. For such a formal occasion, at so testing a time, the ambassador himself took control of the seating plan. Yeah, I met her once. Well, yeah, oh, she don't you know you met her? Yeah, she's well, you've been talking to her. Oh, she's hard. Judge, yeah. you might speak English. No, but he had Philip next to one from China yesterday, that was a disaster. No, isn't one from China more? Yeah, they're both head of departments. Yeah. Chen's always a bit closer to me. Anything to tell me before I am? Patton wants a private word with his press secretary, Mike Hansen. Come in here. Don't let the media know how bad things are. You want them to say that um, we've done rather well to avoid a breakdown. Mm. Tough arguments, but the atmosphere's been... Yeah, restraint in difficult circumstances. <laughs> Fine. Restraint <laughs> <laughs> in difficult circumstances. <laughs> okay. Yes, well, well done. Do you want a bath or anything? Yes, right? I do, actually. I mean, you've, got, you've, got ti you've actually got time. A telegram to London has alerted the Prime Minister. There's a call from number 10. You've actually come out of it pretty well, without giving way. Um, and um, I think not, not looking too um, bad and bruised. I certainly don't. Major is furious that the Chinese have treated Patton so roughly. He's ordered the Foreign Office to cancel a visit to London by a senior Beijing official. Patton is horrified by this overreaction and tells Major's private secretary that the Prime Minister's decision must be reversed. It would bring matters to a head in such a way that it would be more difficult for me to hold public opinion in Hong Kong. I think it would actually 
actually um, uh, lose me support in Hong Kong rather than gain it. And that is my very, very strong advice. He tells number 10 that if necessary, he will fly to London in person to talk Major out of a well-meaning but rash decision. I'd be very grateful if you could say to him, you hope that nothing final will be done until I've managed to make my own position clear. OK, thank you. But I mean, I, I, I think it would be fake. All right? Thank you. Absolutely right, sir. You lose all your friends at home. Uh, can, you, can we now... The Prime Minister was in Cabinet. When told of Patton's views, he agreed to let the visit go ahead. The immediate crisis was over. This is what we, what we think is right for Hong Kong. It doesn't infringe the basic law, but China doesn't agree. So Hansen briefed the press. Restraint in difficult circumstances. And then that might erode a bit of the confidence. And then a month later, you still don't have an agreement. It might erode a little sure. bit more. You might lose it all by the time it has to go sure. to Lechko. So the vote in Lechko will be against. That's all right. And then what's he going to do for the next four years? Live with it. But that's, that's the, at the end of the day, that's what it amounts to. Lechko has to decide. Patton can't decide. All he can do is propose. But you're asking hypothetical questions, and you know the answer to hypothetical questions. Look, can't you just... We can end this conversation fairly quickly. It's very simple. It goes to Exco, it goes to Lechko, and there's a vote. End of issue. As he waits for his Chinese guests, the ambassador is uneasy. I mean, we've had actually quite a lot of crises along the way since 84, and I've been involved in most of them. I don't yet re re regard this one as among the most serious of them, but it could become quite serious uh, because, I mean, the governor has um, certain things he wants to do about, about the elections, and they are important things. But uh, the question is, will Hong Kong people Follow him uh, when the Chinese turn the heat on, which they probably will. What will the Chinese do? They will say, I think, as they've already been hinting, uh, if we can't reach agreement on these uh, constitutional matters, the political development, they will say, if that's the case, uh, if the governor won't listen to reason, I'm going to put it differently, uh, then uh, we will do our own thing in 1997. And then they will try, through their propaganda, to uh, frighten Lechko off so that it doesn't pass the, the necessary legislation, frighten public opinion, and so forth. So it will be pretty hard for the governor to maintain leadership. Excuse me, I'm sorry, because you are, you've got a guest here. Please, please go. The ambassador cabled London accordingly. Patton's team thought that though loyal, he was running scared. Behind the diplomatic niceties, the tension was palpable. China's anger at Patton's impertinence, matched by the governor's irritation at Beijing's obstinacy. The visit had achieved nothing. Patton left the following morning uncertain about China's next move. He did not have long to wait. The governor had barely left Chinese soil before his opposite number delivered his parting shot. We do not want to make public the differences between our two sides. In our view, the essence of the issue or the essence of our differences is not whether the pace of democracy in Hong Kong should be accelerated. The essence, according to us, is whether there should be still cooperation or whether there will be confrontation. If the other side insists on confrontation, we have no other choice. 
Cafe 765, a taxi to the pole behind me now. Where about do we go? The governor arrived back in Hong Kong, unaware of what Liu Ping had said. He was met by his chief secretary, Sir David Ford, who was similarly ignorant of the fact that Beijing was now on the diplomatic warpath. Patton prepared to meet the Hong Kong media. Nothing very... Um... Hong Kong people seem to be holding their nerve pretty well. Good editorials mm. today. That was a good sign, I thought. I think the line for the next few days, and particularly for me tomorrow morning, is... Um, we really can't call constructive cooperation saying no to anything the Hong Kong government ever puts forward, um, but refusing to suggest what should be done instead. Um, let's yeah. have some proposals. Proposals on the airport. Proposals on constitutional development. Sure. <coughs> right. I think that people in Hong Kong would be very surprised uh, if uh, all that uh, we were to hear was criticism and not alternative proposals on the airport or, much more important, political development. Uh, if people don't like my proposals, I think people in Hong Kong uh, would expect them uh, to put forward their own proposals, their own alternatives. Thank you very much indeed. Within hours, all Hong Kong was aware that for Beijing, the governor was now an outcast. I've never experienced uh, in 50 years in politics of this type of uh, situation. Uh, even after June 4th, Tiananmen Square, they talk to each other. In the world history, I cannot see two major sovereign states does that to themselves and to Hong Kong. So I, don't, I cannot speculate what's going to happen. All I'm saying is they got to resolve the difficulties and the problems. I'm not, no, the, that difficulty is only a mild word to, to describe the current situation. What's the real word then? Disaster. It is a disastrous situation for Hong Kong, for Britain, for China. And for what? For few seats in the Legislative Council? Is it all worth it for the two countries to break it, to break their diplomatic relations? over this issue? Is that what exactly what Hong Kong wants? No. There are more and more people are anti patent today. Even people in the street are asking, is he really doing all this for us? What's he after? Do we need this? Why should we be placed on the table to gamble our, 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 our future? When he said it's just a slight and modest increase in democracy, then it's not so important, is it? Why do we have to face all this, people are becoming emotional. There's no neutral ground. Either you are pro-democracy, pro-British, or you're anti-democracy, pro-China. As governor, Chris Patton had a constitutional role as the Queen's representative in this last great colony. That meant playing host to her son. Then, George Shultz, then, as soon as you leave, as soon as the aircraft doors shut, there'll be a blast. They'll have a press conference and they'll denounce you. And again, absolutely right. Exactly. So. But is it proven? I mean, are they still? Are they putting a lot of pressure on now? Are yeah. They, and how I'm afraid that, that what they're trying to do is is um, uh, frighten um, people into um, thinking the game's not worth the candle. We might as well give in. They'd like be regarded as the liberators in 1997, but I'm not sure it'll look quite like that for yeah. the punters. The First Lady, Lavender Patton, also had official duties. As the patron of more than 40 charities, the once reticent politician's wife had to be a star in her own right. And by common consent, she was. I show you uh, a new constructed room right. for speed uh, program. Joe-san. Oh. Joe Joe I do feel that I can help them, um, either by just encouraging the staff 
the parents of handicapped children, just making them feel they haven't been forgotten. In a society like Hong Kong, which is very much sort of money-oriented, you know, business, it's, it's very good to show those people who are doing public service and those who are unfortunate in some way or other that they haven't been forgotten. But, uh, we do care about them, and I, I like to do that. The governor's urgent task was to shore up his own support in the face of China's refusal to talk to him. Playing tennis on my own is a fairly fruitless occupation. Unless the ball comes back over the net, it's rather difficult to have a cooperative game. And what we're talking about here isn't a game. What we're talking about is the prosperity, the stability, and the way of life of Hong Kong. Investors were unnerved. The stock market fell sharply. Were it to nosedive, property values would collapse. There'd be panic. The tycoons and their allies chose this moment to go public. Big business openly against the governor. To run the risk of developing a political structure which will likely be dismantled in four and a half years' time is just not acceptable to us. In public, Patton said nothing, concealing his contempt. I think it's well known that Vincent Lowe is uh, very close to Peking. He and others were very active in putting Peking's case. Beijing itself was also very active. Some people have been made nervous by old-fashioned threats or intimidation. Um, unless you denounce Patton and his works now, you'll have great difficulty in this or that franchise after 1997. You'll have great difficulty doing business in Guangdong. I mean, that, that point is put um, very bluntly and openly to people. You know that for a fact? Oh, I know that for a 18-carat fact. Um, including some very all sorts of ways, some of which would offend your and my civil libertarian consciences. The murmurings against Patton in Hong Kong found a ready echo here at Westminster and in Whitehall. Some of the Foreign Office establishment, those so-called Sinologists who had a free hand to negotiate with Beijing until Patton came along, deplored what they regarded as his combative stance towards China and they chose this moment to go public. My lords, while I very greatly admire the way in which Mr. Patton has endeared himself to people in Hong Kong in such a very short space of time, will the government keep firmly in mind that the reforms he has proposed will be quite valueless to the people of Hong Kong in the long term unless they can be carried through 1997? Is it not a great pity that this dispute over electoral matters should have developed into what amounts to a major confrontation. And there was more. Good evening. The man who negotiated Britain's Hong Kong Treaty with China warns on Newsnight tonight that Britain may be making what he calls a fatal misjudgment. I would say it's the most serious crisis we've had over Hong Kong over the last 10 years. And to find anything like the, the same state of tension, I think I'd have to go back to the Cultural Revolution in the 60s. Until his retirement, just before Patton's appointment, Craddock had been the architect of Britain's relations with China. He now emerged as the governor's most, what others in the Foreign Office were saying in private, that Patton had blown it. His explanation? touches of the old British arrogance with respect to China, that we can force them, face them down. And behind it also lay the besetting weakness of British foreign policy and inability to put oneself in the other man's shoes and to read uh, Chinese reactions. Uh, the governor's behavior, I think, has been, well, there are a number of words one can use for it, but. I suppose use a neutral one, and that is incompetent. The 
governor's frustration with the old guard in and around this building, the Foreign Office, was compounded by the emergence of a collection of letters that went to and fro between the Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd, and his opposite number, Chen Chichen, in 1990. This previously secret correspondence was now flourished by the Chinese as proof that Patton's proposals violated agreements already reached between London and Beijing. The letters themselves are highly technical, but as alleged evidence of British treachery, they split the foreign policy establishment from top to bottom, even pitting one foreign secretary against another. I was startled when I heard of the proposal to reshape and redefine the flight path towards democracy, which had been agreed in correspondence before that, which had been embodied, as I understood it, in the basic law as a fulfillment of the Joint Declaration. It was something to which both sides had agreed. In fact, the Chinese were entitled to be dismayed by the departure from the course of dealings and dismayed by the change in shape of what they saw. I don't believe that that is right. It wasn't that they woke up one morning and said um, that we have an agreement with the British which they're breaking. It was rather that the British were handling this second round in a way which they didn't like, uh, and they then found a formal form of objection to it. But I don't think that really held water. Certainly the Chinese had rights. They had a right to express a view. Uh, but they didn't have a right to insist that that view must be expressed in secret. I think that the sadness is that we gave or appeared to give the Chinese a plausible excuse for beginning to take the petals out of the daisy uh, and themselves to begin making changes beyond those on which we had embarked. For the future record, Lord Howe went even further. It would have been so much better if Hong Kong had got in place a governor who would have played that crucial part of managing the process of transition right up to the last moment. What's um, happened this morning? There was no desire to challenge the Chinese. There's no sense in which Chris Patton went out, or was encouraged to go out, saying, by God, I'm going to take these people on. And they've had it their own way long enough. The conflict between Hurd and Howe was one thing. Far more embarrassing was the extraordinary fact that no official at the Foreign Office had ever mentioned the offending correspondence to Chris Patton. As a result, he drew up his proposals for democratic reform in Hong Kong in sublime ignorance of the fact that this exchange of letters even existed, a failure by past and present officials here that at the time he was at pains to conceal. I've thought about this quite a bit since. Um, it would, of course, I suppose, particularly when I was under a lot of pressure on all this, uh, have been easy for me to dump on officials and say, ah, if I'd known about that, it could have all been different. I don't think it would have been at all, because I don't think that what was um, said in those letters um, represented in any way an agreement. Would you have liked to have known about them nonetheless? I think that um, uh, if one is tidy-minded about these things, um, it might have been helpful. Well, I think there was an oversight. I mean, he, he was not told of them, and I was not reminded of them. Um, it, it never occurred to officials that there was a, a read across from the one negotiation to the other. But they should have told him. I mean, he was an, a newcomer to it. They should have told him. Uh, I think all that, all that happened was that it, it put us unnecessarily on the back foot. Um, it, was the only, it was the only time um, that I really felt when talking about whether we breached the joint declaration or the basic law or whatever. It was the only time when I felt slightly on the back foot, um, and that was unnecessary. You didn't tell him. Why not? Well, it was part of history, part of his brief. It was known to everybody. It was uh, inconceivable that a governor going out to Hong Kong would not have, have all these in front of him and have read them uh, several times. I think if they were significant, um, in their relevance to the democratic development of Hong Kong. It's amazing that Sir Percy didn't mention them to me uh, because he has an all-embracing knowledge of these matters, except, of course, that since he doesn't believe there's any commitment to the democratic development of Hong Kong... Patton flew to London for meetings with the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary. Their task, to demonstrate to the Chinese that he still had the support of the Cabinet. I'd just like to say that it's been a 
pleasure to talk through Hong Kong matters with the governor. The proposals he's put forward for the next stage in the constitutional development of Hong Kong are skillful and well justified, and they have our full support. However, inside the Foreign Office, key officials argue that Patton's confrontation would inflict severe damage on Sino-British relations. Their views had started to leak into the media. Patton, who despised them as appeasers, asked Heard to read the Riot Act. He's going to make it clear to one or two people who are, if not starting to suggest that we should offer reparations, at least, um, that we should... Um, start throwing away um, bits of the policy. I think he's going to want to make it clear that um, that's not on. I mean, why should one um, play the game entirely by their rules? Why should one accept their definition of what a principled position is or what consultation is? Wouldn't do it with um, others, so why should one do it with China? If being a Sinologist um, is taking that view, then I'm quite glad I'm not a Sinologist. And when they tell you he doesn't understand the culture of this great empire of China, he's a parochial, provincial bull in a very delicate China shop, what's the feeling you have in there? The feeling I have is that if I look back over the last few months, um, most of the bulls are Chinese. <laughs> A new road from Hong Kong into China. The builder, one of the colony's most bullish tycoons, Gordon Wu. I think all Chinese are born entrepreneurs from the uh, chop suey and chow mein and laundry places in America and the takeout dinners in the UK. I think they're all entrepreneurs. Well, I've been working here for 14 years now and I've yet to meet a communist. To me, they're all capitalists, they're all entrepreneurs. I think we speak the same language and I feel extremely comfortable working with them. And their tactics are definitely entrepreneurial. For instance, we want to get this thing done in a hurry uh, and for a little bit of bonus and they say we'll work 24 hours. And I like what I hear. Next week, I think we can get some concrete and, and the week after. When you got a whole body of people, we stop waving the red book and start working. What do they expect? Yeah, they get money, of course. Gordon Wu had borrowed big for this project, but had few worries. Uh, in a year, I think our share of the profits will be roughly, uh, well, it depends on the traffic, but I think a conservative estimate would be something like 50, 60 million US dollars for my cut of it. 15, 16? No, 5, 0, oh, and 6, oh. 50, 60 million, your cut? Quite a good investment. Well, it's only the beginning, and as traffic builds up, you know, I, I won't be surprised if he hits uh, over 100 million. He was not impressed by Patton's conflict with China. I think it's a case of where Western ideas and Eastern ideas, uh, they clash, and, and you know, I, I think Governor Patton is a good man. He wanted to, to bring democracy to Hong Kong overnight, but I think a more a gradual timetable is probably better in that you bring democracy to Hong Kong over time and not overnight. Because, you know, I mean, you, you, if you look back at, at, at the history of England, the, uh, although the Magna Carta was 1215, but the, the House of Lords is still appointed today, 700 odd years later. So why the hurry? <laughs> At Government House, the rituals of colonial life were still intact. In this case, an investiture. Patton standing in for the Queen. As always, civil servants took most of the gongs, but their loyalty to the Crown was under severe strain. By command of Her Majesty the Queen, I will present British Empire medal. In the firing line as government officials, many of them were unnerved by the stridency with which China now warned Hong Kong against Patton. I don't want to underestimate that. They really gave us um, hell last week. Um, they put immense pressure on the business community, from brutal threats to gentle persuasion. Whatever would work, they used it. They panicked the business community. They panicked the stock exchange. They panicked a good proportion of the public. 
and they panicked a fair proportion of the civil service. The civil service is, is very vulnerable. A great many of them feel it is not worth the battle. So why on earth are you leading us into a battle that we can't possibly win? You're, um, you're preparing to, to make yourselves heroes or salve your own consciences, but it's we that are going to have to be here after 1997. <laughs> By the end of the year, public opinion had started to desert the governor, and the pressure got to him. Oh, I think the governor went through um, a bad patch in the, in the past 10 days or so as the campaign against us gathered pace. Um, he became a bit quiet and gloomy, I think. But there's a reason for that, and I think I've, I've worked out that he has a way of coping with pressure. When he looks at he looks at what might go wrong. Now, some people would look at what might go wrong very coldly, analytically analyze it, put it on one side. He doesn't do that. He sort of lives it for a while. Now, this could go wrong now. How would we respond to that? How would we cope with it? What would it feel like to have to cope with that? Now, he, does, he goes through that sort of process, thinks himself into it, and rehearses it emotionally, not coldly. I wouldn't discount the unnerving um, nature of some of what's been happening. And I wouldn't underestimate the extent to which one does sometimes wonder, was it all worth it? Should I have settled for improving my tennis and having a quiet life and giving in gracefully? But the way they're behaving and the way they do behave actually makes me feel even more strongly that what we're trying to do is right. Um, otherwise, what is Hong Kong going to be like after 1997? Some of the things that have been going on, as you know, are just awful. Was last week, for you, the blackest week so far? Mm. How black was it? It was pretty bad. Um, because you can't help um, having the odd self-doubt. And uh, waking up in the middle of the night and not going back to sleep again, night after night. So yes, it was pretty awful. And I dare say there'll be some more pretty awful ones to come before this is um, over. Hi, how are you? There was no respite. Patton decided to redouble his efforts, to go out among the people, to restore confidence, and to keep his nerve. He did still have fans. Hello. I'm the president of Hong Kong Outstanding Students Association. Yeah, it's my name. <laughs> oh, he's uh, just like a political star. He has a planned idea, I think. He wants Hong Kong to be more democratic. But sometimes it may be too fast for us. Norris Lam was herself something of a star. She was top of her class, president of a students' association, and the organizer of a school trip to China. They are really rather conservative. And I think maybe in that way we can tell them. Hong Kong students can tell more about our world to them. And I will tell them there's something important in the democratic country, such as uh, we have the right to speak freely and we have the freedom of religion, etc. That is our right, human right. Their Chinese hosts took them on the usual tourist route. Perplexingly, for a first visit, this included a firing range, courtesy of the People's Liberation Army. The students were shown the sights of Guangzhou 
and in Norris Lamb's case, discovered that the mainland was far less foreign than she'd expected, that the people were not so alien. Except, that is, when it came to matters of ideology and education. From Norris Lamb's perspective, their hosts also had a curious sense of entertainment. Not that the traditional dances were other than delightful, but simply that they seemed to belong to a different age, a different culture, and a very different official outlook. Early in the new year, Patton felt a severe pain in his chest while playing tennis. He entered hospital for tests, which showed blocked arteries. They gave him angioplasty. He was out of action for a fortnight. And then, his spirits restored, he was once more on the offensive, urging the Legislative Council to stand up against China. A part of Hong Kong's um, admirable political development is that you're not a rubber stamp for the 28th British governor of Hong Kong, and you won't be a rubber stamp after 1997 either. And that is what part of this argument is all about. China had not quite shut the door on negotiations with Britain about patent reforms. There were talks about talks. What they have set up to date is um, before we talk, the triple violator, your humble servant, um, must um, actually withdraw his proposals. Now they say um, the triple violator must withdraw his proposals. But they don't say we'll, we won't talk unless he withdraws his proposals. They go on to say the talks must be on the basis of the joint declaration, the basic law, exchange between the um, uh, foreign secretaries, fine by me because one of the things that comes out of um, a study of those, of those sacred texts is the Chinese commitment to a through train. And we shall be examining in the talks, among other things, um, exactly what the Chinese mean by that. Because what they at present mean by a through train is that um, you might get on it in 1995 as a, legislature, as a legislator, but if they don't like the look of you, they'll throw you off in 1997. Some train. And if the talks were to start, what were the odds of success? Three to one against. A few days later, the talks about talks turned into negotiations proper. Although he was pretty pessimistic about their prospects, he had no choice but to give them a go. If he didn't, even his supporters, who in number, if not in power and influence, far outweighed his opponents, would regard him as reckless and foolhardy. That decision made, Patton took his case to the Americans. I think if you're a politician, being in Washington is like um, a cricket fan being at Lord's or a Jesuit being in Rome. It's the center of all that's um, most interesting and exciting in the interplay between politics and the way the world works. Patton's purpose was precise but secret, to urge the administration to put commercial pressure on China to respect his reforms in Hong Kong. It's uh, my hope that my visit this week will have helped to ensure that um, everybody takes account of our position when they're um, framing their final policy. It was a delicate task. I very much hope that they will take the point that the US and the rest of the world will be looking at the way
Peking treats Hong Kong as a touchstone for how much China can be encouraged to join polite international society. To be received at the White House was genuinely useful. What Patton needed was an endorsement from the President of the United States. He got it. I think that uh, the democracy initiative in Hong Kong is a good thing. You know, it's one of the world's most vibrant, thriving, important cities. It is an incredible center of commerce and, uh, and a haven of opportunity for millions of people. And I think the idea of trying to keep it an open and free society after 1997 is in the best interest of the Chinese. So I, I think this initiative is well-founded, and I support it. And I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but it, how can the United States be against democracy? That's our job, to get out there and promote it. Thank you. It had been a good meeting. Is that all right, Mike? Very often, when you meet political leaders, you wonder why they got involved in politics, because they don't seem to like humanity very much. But he's obviously somebody who got involved in politics because he does like um, uh, people. Yes, it is indeed the governor. Here we are. He's big, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's you know tall, um, big chest. Impressive. As yeah, well. an impressive man. It's that American diet, it's all those steaks. Hong Kong was not only a litmus test for the Americans, it also had great pulling power for the British, not least for the governor's former colleagues, all of whom deemed it vital to pay a call. We've got Julian Shepherd. But there was serious business as well. The talks with China in Beijing had reached round three. Phone is here. Do you want to um, call people in? Patton's team is assembled to assess progress. Although the negotiations are being conducted by Britain's ambassador in Beijing, the governor and his team are in charge of British policy. It's their job to judge whether China is willing to compromise and how Britain should respond. So we're going to uh, give some ground, but it would be characteristic that they have one last push on their principles first. Um, and the way they tell it, it does read a bit as though, as though that might be about to happen. But um, I can't be sure they, they, they could just keep this up for another two days. I mean, that, if they want to um, step around the hole which they've dug in the road, that actually helps them to do yeah. so, doesn't it? When in doubt, that's the governor. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Make sure you, sure you denounce the governor right. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Plan on folks, mm. as the minister would say. Two, two word telegram, we agree? Yeah. yeah. Carry on. Yes, carry on. Carry on. <laughs> Meantime, we're going off the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> the helicopter's weary. <laughs> yeah. A secondary school overlooking Hong Kong Harbour. A very ordinary school with a very extraordinary headmaster. No one in the British colony knew more about what was really in China's mind than Zhang Yok Sing. Mm, yes, when I became interested in politics and in China, coincided with the most perhaps chaotic years in the mainland, uh, the Cultural Revolution. Zhang Yok Sing was a student radical who found himself caught up in the fervor of the Maoist upheaval, an upheaval which seeped across the border into Hong Kong. There was much violence. Demonstrators and police officers were killed. The British almost lost control. The student, now the head teacher, became a communist. I believe in Marxism. I believe well, in most of the uh, 
theories Marx put forward, but not in the sense that I belong to any communist political party. He is, however, the leader of the pro-Beijing Democratic Alliance Party. I have to take the Beijing line as far as possible. And, and, I, and I also feel that it is my duty, because, because um, I believe that there is still uh, an imbalance in the sort of uh, information, uh, sort of uh, uh, commentary that the public in Hong Kong are getting uh, from the media and from, from, from other public figures. He keeps close contact with the leaders in Beijing, and he does know their thinking. The Chinese, of course, have always said that they are not going to compromise on matters of principle. And where the Chinese believe that Mr. Patton's proposals are in blatant violation of the principle of convergence basic law and previous agreements between the two governments, the Chinese won't budge. On the other hand, of course, the Chinese still believe that uh, Mr. Patton is now trying to make trouble uh, with the intention of um, setting up an independent political uh, force in Hong Kong to oppose the Beijing government after 1997. In another part of the city, a very different perspective. Grace Wu buys and sells Ming furniture, imported from China and sold to the rest of the world. Her showroom is a magnet for international collectors, but she and her colleagues walk a fine line with China. If, if they smuggle things in furniture out, let's say, uh, that's because the wood is prohibited, but the category is not. But and if, you, if they were caught, then... and if they were caught, it's a fine. But if it's cultural heritage objects, when wood, then it's death. <laughs> <laughs> she and her friends betray a common ambivalence about the virtues of freedom and democracy. I think we are not so interested in politics, normally. I think for uh, general Chinese, we, we are not so interested in politics. So uh, a little, a very small freedom in politics is good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? What's important to you? If I can do my business freely, I can uh, speak my mind freely, I think that's good enough. When you say speak your mind freely, what does yeah, that mean? I can voice my opinion in public, mm -hmm. say I can talk to Harold, or uh, to Grace. Whatever uh, I think is right, you know, it should be okay. And yeah. I'm, I, I won't get into politics. No, he means except politics. Except right? politics. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I know it's a good idea that uh, people's rights are respected uh, and that difference of opinion uh, should be allowed as a space. Yes, intellectually. But how important is it to you? Saying it's, important, not it's important to me. It's important enough to, to make you stay or go? Not to make it go. It's important to me, but having said that, I, I understand because of that long tradition of our history, I understand why people can feel that, well, if, if I'm not in politics. Politics is not my concern anyway. What, what concerns me is just uh, my business, <laughs> and that's what I can tell you. And what's important to your business? Making money. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> you are asking something from yeah. a very Westerner's point yeah. of view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think most people really care very much about whether we have democracy or not. And at least I don't think that many people understand democracy as it really, you know, is. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, people in Hong Kong want stability. They just want to carry on business, mm -hmm. as Mr. Ng says, to make a living to make money. You go straight to the basic. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the prosperity, the money really? factor. You, you go on the street. That's all it boils down to. Money. Yes, I would say so. Sir Percy Craddock is due in town shortly. The bunting is out. You're interested that he's coming? Yes. Um, I doubt he's coming to be helpful. Craddock was in Hong Kong en route for China. Patton had not been told. 
Then he discovered that officials in the foreign office had given their former master a full briefing before his departure. I was, as they say, in no card plays course. And did you get on to the foreign office and tell them, stop being helpful? Yes. And um, I insisted that they um, asked Sir Bertie Craddock not to go. And I insisted that they stop briefing him. Craddock was unrepentant. If we were really interested in Hong Kong, we could revert to cooperation with the Chinese. It would be painful, it would be humiliating, but if we're concerned with Hong Kong and not with ourselves, we should be ready to do it. If we don't do it, then the question is, whom are we trying to benefit? Who are we fighting for? So I'm afraid people will be tempted to draw the conclusion that in the end we think more of our own prestige, more of our own consistency, uh, more about making heroic gestures here than about the welfare of the people we are committed to protect. I think we are in danger of failing in our responsibilities towards Hong Kong. That's a very harsh charge to lay against Chris Patton that he's putting himself before the people of Hong Kong. If that is the conclusion to be drawn, I can't see that it's to be avoided. I think Sir Percy, for reasons which um, I'm sure he'll explain to the world, has moved from being um, a critic on the sideline to actively working to screw up what we're doing. Um, I guess because Anything, any guesses on my part are, are excessively speculative, so I would not say one. What is the guess? Maybe success would be too painful. Would you prefer in 97 to be saying, I'm very sorry, I was wrong, and Patton was right, or is there an element of hubris which makes one say, I have to believe that I am right, and if he turns out to be right, that would be, for me, a personal disaster. I think that's a very, that's a very unfair question, Jonathan. In London, Craddock's former colleagues waited for the latest news from the British Embassy in Beijing, where the talks with China had entered the sixth round. They detected a scintilla of progress. It's quite important, I think, that they have dropped this idea that they can force a concession out of us on one issue before they move on to the next one. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's ground really gained, I think. Um, we've got some views, and are frankly very good views, on, on these functional constituencies. Um, but it's, it's grist to be working with. Um, and I think we, we now go on and try and get at least the same level of detail on the other side. As you say, they really have decided that salami tactics aren't going to work, that we're going to insist that we have everything else on the table before we're going to be able to work out the, the parameters for a possible deal. I think the fact the governor's coming back next week has also obviously concentrated minds. And they've wanted to try and improve the atmosphere of it, of it in advance of that. There's also the international aspect, yeah. I suppose. I think that's true. I mean, they've just had this, uh, this decision by President Clinton on, on MFN, which has renewed, but, but subject to, uh, mm. to conditions next year. Yeah. So they're not yeah, completely they're off the hook. But, um, it's a very small movement, and all it means is that we've now begun the proper negotiations that we should have begun last right. November. Yeah, I don't know if this is the end of the opening or the beginning of the middle game. It's certainly nothing, it's certainly nothing further down the line than that. I think we'd better have a brief for the Secretary of State to use at the Cabinet Committee. Reports number 10. Um, clearing it back with Hong Kong, which we can do. Yeah. I mean, we'll fax that out um, as soon as we've got it yeah. and get an answer back by, well, a couple of hours' time, I suppose, before they go off the air in Hong Kong. The governor was in London again for a progress meeting with the cabinet. At least, that was the ostensible purpose. Once again, however, there was an ulterior motive. It's one, of, uh, it's one of three options. And Today's meeting was a political, it might not have been like that, but it was to demonstrate the harmony between London and Hong Kong, 
um, the complete commitment no um, to uh, the approach that we've taken. We are keen that these discussions should continue. Our mild but growing impatience and shared objectives in the talks and to give a little burnishing to the threat of the mad governor breaking loose again. When these talks were about to start, you gave them three to one against a deal. What's the rating now, the betting? I think about 50-50, um, which is a mark of um, how far we've come. I mean, at every stage, um, you sit there politely for a time, and they shout and rave, um, and then it happens. The talks went on and on, round after round in the fruitless search for compromise. We on the British side are approaching these discussions in a positive and constructive way. We're not prepared to stand up for Hong Kong's way of life today. What chance of doing so tomorrow? And I cannot see how so many intelligent people sitting down together for 100 hours achieving so little. I think it's just ridiculous. It's worse than the Sino-British negotiations in 83, 84, where even the sovereignty of Hong Kong was settled. It will not be put forward to uh, LegCo for the time being, and that's the present position. We now have only weeks rather than months to conclude these talks. First of all, the Chinese officials have to come round to the understanding that there is no big conspiracy behind the British proposals for political reform in Hong Kong. Really can't. I haven't got anything new to say. Judging by the way Chris Patton is getting across his points, I think we're very close to a breakdown in, in the political uh, talk. What I fear is a miscalculation. In the 15th round, after seven months of fruitless negotiation, in which the Chinese refused to budge an inch, Patton thought he detected signs of what he hoped would be an 11th hour breakthrough. Uh, five to midnight, I think, rather than 11th hour. Uh, more familiar um, uh, hands, as far as China is concerned, than me, uh, say that this is what always happens, that they wait until the very last moment and then make a move. What we can't tell at the moment is whether the move was mainly meant um, at the Cabinet Committee meeting um, to string us along for a bit longer or whether it was for real. But it was substantial, and substantial enough, in my judgment, um, probably be, to be for real. But there were always more questions than answers, not least about Deng Xiaoping, paramount leader and president of the All-China Bridge Federation. Who, who is running China? Is China being run by the president of the All-China Bridge Federation? Is it being run by a collective of other worthies? Our assessments of what's going on in Peking are always subject to the caveat that I'm not sure any of us know what happens in that secret society.